So this looks quite right. So hello everyone. Um, I'm here to talk about mobile apps with GWT and PhoneGap. Um, this is going to. Is it okay for you? Do you need to speak louder? Should I use the mic? If, would you prefer the mic? Okay, let's let's use the mic then. Okay. Um, uh, this is going to be about 60 minutes presentation and 30 minutes Q&A. Feel free to ask questions at any time. Um, first, I'm going to be talking about the motivation, why using GWT and PhoneGap together is such a good idea. Then we're going to talk about what PhoneGap actually is. A little bit about GWT. Who has never seen GWT before? Okay, two people, so this is okay that it's there. And when we have GWT PhoneGap, and I'm going to talk about 30 minutes about MGWT. Um, the other things about myself, my name is Daniel Kurka, I'm a software architect and I'm an open source committer. And I'm going to be an uh, open source committer in GWT as well. And uh, this is why we started two open source projects, MGWT and GWT PhoneGap, about three years ago. I also do like to experiment. So I wrote down your frustration and the number of slides I'm going to use, and I think 60 minutes should be okay with, let's say, around about 80 slides. I thought I'd try it with uh, 348 slides. So we have to hurry up now. And also, I'm a web developer for about 15 years. So there's one deep thing in me, and that says mobile apps have to die. This is a quite st a strange statement because mobile apps are doing quite well. They're earning lots of billions of dollars, but I have to have like five minutes to explain myself, and then you see it. One thing about me, I'm the prototype of a geek. So if I want to build something that drives, I just build it myself. If I want to know something about electricity, I just toy around with it. And if I want to know something about physics, I just build something that can fly. So I've built a lot of hardware in my career and a lot more software. And this means 2007 was a really great year for me because I could carry all the software I was doing in my pocket and show it to people. But soon my phone looked like this, cluttered with different software. Does anybody know how much software, how many apps you could carry around with you at startup? Come on, have a guess. No, it was 144. And I hit that about like 10 days after the SDK got released. <laughs> Apple quickly discovered that even normal people need more than 144 apps, introduced something called a folder concept, where you can nest applications into folders. And then you end up with 1,684 apps. And at first I thought this is quite a nice idea because I can fit all my apps on my phone. The second one was, really? I can't find any apps on my phone. Nobody wants to select from 1,600 items. This is just confusing for users. And let's just take a look back at the web. In the web, we had the same problem about 10, 15 years ago. And there was one company called Yahoo. And what they basically did, they had a bunch of editors who searched the web and put what they found into a catalog so that people could search inside that catalog. And then along came Google and decided that this is not such a great idea because the number of web pages is going to explode. So you need some way to automate this process to show people what they really want to see. And then you end up with happy users and you have a big, big company to build on. And if you take a look at app stores right now, in app stores, people have to find the content themselves. They have to install the content themselves, and they have to get rid of the content themselves from their phones. This has nothing to do with web search, as we do web search today. So app stores kind of look like this. You get all the stuff that you don't really need, and you have to pick out the things you really want with no help at all. And I think this is getting worse, worse by the month. Why is this? Because it's not just about people like me who have too much <coughs> software on their phones. It's about normal peeping, the people doing much more things with their phones every day. So in the near future, we're going to pay for our coffee with our phones. We're going to pay for shopping with our phones. 
we are going to pay for gas with our phones. And our expectation will change if we, want, if we get someplace. Today, one simple example, I was in Berlin a few weeks ago to do a talk on MGWT. And when you get to Berlin, it's a good idea to use the public transport system because otherwise you get just get stuck in traffic. And you get to the bus stop or the metro station, and now you need to do is find out the name of the company that runs the public transportation in Berlin, go to the App Store, search for that name, install the app to find out when the next bus is coming. This is plain wrong. Normally, you just want to know when the next bus is coming when you get to, this, uh, get to the bus stop and buy the ticket for it. Some websites even have that double-crossed. If you go to the failblock.org, they suggest you to install an app for the content you could just see on your phone. This would end up with hundreds of little small apps on my phone that just clutter my phone instead of web pages. The web has a reason for being there. And you get a grasp of what's about to happen if you talk to people who build smart devices every day. Basically, they tell you the cost for a sophisticated ARM CPU is going to drop less than 10 cents in 2012, 2013. So we're about to put a CPU in almost everything that can do some sophisticated computing. So the number of things we're going to do is, is going to simply explode. in a short amount of time. Let's think about things you don't do normally with your phone. It's going to be normal to open up your doors at home with your phone. Do I need an app for that? The app for the bus store, I don't really need if I'm sitting at home in my living room watching TV. Then I'm most likely going to need a remote for my TV. So we need some kind of search provider for our apps on our phones. For the functionality we used to do in our browsers, which is somewhat the Google search. But right now we're missing that for phones. We're cluttering phones with stuff they don't really need. And people have to garbage collect their phones, which creates some kind of weird threshold to install something. Do I really need it? Ah, maybe I don't need it that often. So there's a big difference. Let's recap. I'm suggesting that uh, the number of things we do on our phones is going to explode in a short amount of time. Of course, there are going to be apps for things I do like every day. But for the other things I do like occasionally, there are going to be websites. And the web is much better as, uh, at such things. And the question I'm asking is how can you provide software for both those worlds from one code base? And one answer to that is PhoneGap. I'm not going to introduce you technically to PhoneGap. I'm just going to explain the problem PhoneGap tries to solve the technical view we're going to do in a few minutes. Fonga addresses the following problem. If you want to produce software for those uh, hardware vendors like Apple, Samsung, then you have to know about their different OSs. And you have to know about their different languages and different APIs. This is a lot of stuff to learn. There's a lot of people who have to learn different APIs to program to different things. The other weird thing is this is constantly changing. This was the problem in 2010. This is what it looks like in 2011, and it already looks different in 2012. And as a web developer, I think of this as a big fail. We already have something to bring software to different platforms without caring too much about uh, the actual platform. It's called the web. And there's PhoneGap to solve that problem. Um, the idea with PhoneGap is you build on standards, basically HTML5, and you can deploy your app everywhere. Let's do a quick comparison between native development and web development. This has been done by many people before and shouldn't be any new news. If you do native development, you got slow development because you have to do it for every platform. You don't get any portability, and therefore you have high costs. You get really good performance on the devices. You get all the native functionalities, and you can be in any app stores. Frankly, this changes if you do web development. You do have fast development times, therefore low costs. You have lots of portability. Something that runs inside an iOS web browser probably runs in an Android web browser. You get good performance if you know what, you, what you're doing. We're going to be talking a lot about performance tonight. 
you get no native functionality at all, so no access to the contact address book, the file system, something like that. And you can't certainly be in any app stores. If you put PhoneGap into the mix, this suddenly changes. Because PhoneGap is something called a hybrid. It's a web app and it's a native app as well. So basically you have best of both worlds. And there's one big promise with PhoneGap in the room. You build things once. Based on standards, you wrap PhoneGap around and you can let them run anywhere. And anywhere means anywhere. This means iOS, Android, Blackberry, uh, WebOS, Symbian, Bada, and lots and lots and lots more. And across all those different platforms, you get a consistent API for the device features. So this is PhoneGap in three minutes. So we know with PhoneGap and HTML5 you can build such apps. Now you need a tool for building them. And this is GWT. Um, very quickly with GWT you're able to use Java to build JavaScript apps. So there's a compile step involved, of course. Um, you can write, run, test everything in Java with all the tools involved. But for runtime, you just compile it down with a very smart compiler, and you get a very efficient JavaScript. And this is quite important for mobile, because on mobile, we have this very slow CPUs. We are running on battery. And if we do unnecessary things, we're just going to drain batteries. And we have very, very slow network connections. And this is why GWT is a very good fit to drain the last thing out of your app for mobile development. But right now, if you put GWT and PhoneGap together, you can't use both together very easy. And this is why we started MGWT and GWT PhoneGap. In GWT PhoneGap, it's all about access from GWT to PhoneGap. And MGWT is something like touch support and great looking widgets for mobile. Both projects are under Apache 2.0 license. There's a really great way to build great HTML5 apps, which I can build once deploy them into any app store using PhoneGap, or I can just put them on a web server and have a web page. So let's remember the people who get to the bus stop. I could put something like a QR code on the bus stop and let the people visit the web page. If they want to do that regularly, like every day, they're just going to install the app, which is made from the same code base. So people who had to garbage collect their phones, because we throw things at them they don't really, have on their, they don't really want to have on their phones, you transform it to happy users. So this was like the uh, motivation for GWT, PhoneGap, and all that's going to follow. This wasn't any technical law. We're going to get technical right now. Um, any questions so far? Where stands GWT for? The, that's the Google Web Toolkit. And it depends what features you want to use. I think the question was, um, if you install an app on Android, you get prompted for all the different permissions. And if PhoneGap has all those different APIs, do you need to give all the permissions at once? It depends. If you're building an app that only needs the camera, you're just going to prompt for the camera. And that's fine. You're just not going to use the different parts of PhoneGap anyhow. Let's talk a little bit about the technology stack involved, because this is quite a lot of parts. If you want to write a web app with this approach, you're going to have the device, you're going to have the browser. On top of that, you're going to have MGWT for great looking UI. And a little bit of your code to have your functionality in it. If you want to write an app, the right part stays exactly the same. On the left, we get PhoneGap, the project, as a container. And we get GWT PhoneGap for connectivity as well. So what we're going to do now is take a look at the different building blocks. I don't think we need to take a look at the devices. So let's start with PhoneGap. PhoneGap always consists of two parts, the native part and the JavaScript part. Okay, before I dig deeper into PhoneGap, um, let's talk a little bit about Cordova and PhoneGap. Maybe some of you know, maybe you don't. Um, PhoneGap started out in 2008 as a great open source project. 
It's a very good idea and it gained lots and lots of traction. Many, many users. I think it's about 5,000 downloads now per day. So it's quite huge. And about a half year ago, um, Adobe decided that it's that good of a tool that they actually wanted to buy it. But uh, the PhoneGap people had gathered such a great and good community that they decided to donate all the uh, source code for PhoneGap to the Apache Software Foundation. And this is what Cordova is now. So the open source part is Cordova with all the APIs and everything. And you can think of PhoneGap as one distribution of PhoneGap, like Ubuntu is one distribution of the Linux kernel. No, not at all. It's just, right now it's just a distribution. Probably Adobe is going to build some tools on that. I, I've seen something with, uh, but I'm not a designer with Photoshop involved, building apps directly from Photoshop and s stuff like that. So they are interested in having some other thing than Flash running on mobile devices, and PhoneGap is their way to get uh, software to mobile devices. But that's not my part. I don't really know anything about that. I'm more interested in the open source part of Cordova. It's mm -hmm. also an environment to develop uh, apps uh, with JavaScript and HTML for every OS that there is. Okay, the comparison between Titanium and PhoneGap, um, I think this is one basic decision you have to do. If you're willing to use Titanium, which basically says you write your app in JavaScript, but all the widgets are native, so you're believing in that Titanium will always provide every platform you're going to need. Yeah, I would put, uh, so you're putting your future into the hands of one company. Yeah, that's true. Um, with PhoneGap, you're just building websites, nothing more. And you're just adding, we're going to talk about that technically, just a okay. small uh, JavaScript API on top of that. But let's, let's take a look first. Uh, I understand what you're well, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, the problem is we have all those different APIs. And this is going to change in the future. We're not having like Windows 90% share. So we have all those different APIs. We have to deal with them. And we need some way to leverage the web. And uh, PhoneGap is exactly, is, is exactly about that. You're going to, com if you compare native and web, you get the hybrid approach. We can do anything. So let's take a look inside how it actually works. Every PhoneGap app has two parts. It got a web part and a native part. In the web part, you have the so-called native web control. Inside that, you're just going to put your HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. On the right side, you got the so-called PhoneGap plugins. This is something like the standard plugins, like the accelerometer, camera, capture. You can build your own plugins, like custom plugins, like the batch barcode and the child browser. So this is just normal native code for every platform. If I want to write a plugin for Android, I have to write Java code. If I want to write a plugin for iOS, I have to write Objective-C. Nothing fancy to see here. And then there is one great thing, the so-called foreign function interface, which connects both worlds. Let's take a look at the native web control first. This is just a browser. Really, just a browser with no Chrome. So just a full screen browser. So basically, if you know how to build good websites with HTML5, you're good to go to write your PhoneGap app. And if you take a look at the different platforms, like iOS, you can see, okay, there's a WebKit underneath with WebCore and JavaScript Core. If you take a look at Android, there's WebKit with the V8 JavaScript engine. If you take a look at BlackBerry, and so you see WebKit. The only thing that's different here is Windows Phone 7.5 with IE9. So basically, if you know how to write apps for a good modern browser, you're almost good for every platform. So let's take a look at the communication between the web part of the app and the native part. And this is very easy explained by a simple example. Let's say we want to shoot a picture. This is something we couldn't do as a web app. We cannot access the camera directly. So this calls for a phone gap call. And as soon as you include the, uh, include the PhoneGap JS file, you get a camera object on your navigator object. Now I can simply do from JavaScript navigator.camera.getPicture, 
pass in two functions, one, that's gets, uh, one that gets called if you have a success, one that gets called if you have a fail, and some options. Here I'm setting the quality to 70% of the camera. In the next step, the PhoneGap JavaScript API is going to change this internally. You, you, all, you all only have to know about this part. So it says, okay, we have to execute a plugin, and the plugin is com.phonegap.camera. We have to execute the function getPicture. And it puts the options into an array of objects. And it passes in the functions. In the next step, it builds a URL. It starts with gap, then the plugin we want to execute, a callback ID, and the options encoded as URL encoded string. And now it takes this URL and puts it into a hidden iframe. And now the native code sees this navigation and immediately cancels it. But he sees the URL, so he knows, okay, what do I need to execute? Okay, I need to execute this plugin, this function, with his options. So as long as you have a way to cancel navigation in your web control, one communication channel already works. This is why PhoneGap works across such a variety of uh, different devices. So now the native code is running the camera, doing some things. And after a while, the user is satisfied with a picture and chooses to use this picture for your app. And at this point, the native code calls back into JavaScript by calling phone app callback success with the callback ID and a message. And now with this callback ID, you can easily find the function and call your success function. So as long as you have the ability to cancel navigation within your browser control and call JavaScript for native code, you do have a communication channel. Of course, this isn't the fastest communication channel, but for small data, this is absolutely fine. Everything needs to be encoded into strings, and your API methods should be async. So with that code, No, you, actually there's one view coming up to take a picture. I can show that live later. Okay. Um, let's say if you want to read the accelerometer, you don't need any extra views, you just get the data back. Um, let's say you want to upload a file, some big data. This is going to be handled in native code, of course. You're not going to put the file through this process. So, but what you should take from this is it's a very easy way of communicating. And this is why it works across such a variety of uh, devices. And very reliable. Question, will this work with any web browser or only with platforms native browser? This will work with any web browser. I've built this myself uh, for Eclipse, for the Eclipse framework. So um, with this is basically the SWT browser underneath, which has different platforms. I'm only using the navigation cancel and the ability to execute JavaScript from Java. Plugins, right? And that's what one slide says. And aren't those plugins browser dependent? Or? No, those aren't browser plugins. Those are called plugins in a phone gap way. Okay. But um, those things which you got here are the things you're going to access for over the foreign function interface. You don't have any browser plugins any way you would have them in a normal browser. No way. Okay. So, so sorry, yeah. feel free. Do you have to write your own, do you ha must you write your own plugins or are they available in the open source community? This is a very nice question because my next slide. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, not sorry. This is great. Um, for most of the platforms, of course, you will not write a, a plugin for handling uh, the accelerometer. You get this as a plugin for almost everything. You can see the iPhone. Uh, 3GS and newer, it's the only old BlackBerry browsers don't have an accelerometer, so you don't get them, but you're good to go. Same API for the accelerometer across every platform. And you get those for the camera, compass, contact, file, geolocation, media, network, notifications, sounds, vibration, storage, and so on. But if that isn't enough... On one, uh, on one business, Titania, who makes these plugins? You know, these, those are made by the community. And okay. for, for most of the platform, it's already there. Okay. If you want to write something that's not there, you're free to go. But you have to do it per platform once. How easy is it to find out uh, what capabilities the phone has? What capabilities? Yeah. What do you mean so by capabilities? If you want to know if there's a camera on the phone, if you want to know 
want to show either show them a camera button or they can take a picture. Or not. This is this is quite easy. There's something in the API for that. Um, there are lots and lots of lots of plugins that we use and that which work really great. So if you want to start building something, take a look at the hundreds of plugins which are already there. If you want to, let's let's take one for instance. If you want to display another web page within your app, the child browser is the way to go, which just launches another browser. We can point to any location. If you want to do, let's say, OAuth with Twitter, that's the way to go. But I think there's a OAuth plugin for Twitter as well, so maybe. Let's take a look at Hello World and PhoneGap so you get a grasp of how this is actually looking from a developer's perspective. So this is just a normal HTML document. Um, nothing fancy to see here. You include the JavaScript for PhoneGap right here. And uh, then you just put in some little code. What you normally do, you register yourself for a so-called device-ready event because sometimes the native part takes some time to set up. It needs to be ready for it to be called. And as soon as it's ready, it's going to fire. So we put in our on-device-ready function here. And as soon as the native part is ready, we can ask something like device name, device phone gap, device platform, device UAD, device version. We could also put in the navigator.camera that get picture. And this function shoot a picture. So if you know how to code JavaScript, you're good to go. What I really like about phone gap, though, is phone gap sees itself as an intermediate. Um, with native um, app development, it's always like the people can do the nice stuff and we as the web developers, we have to wait like two or three years to do the same stuff. With PhoneGap, we don't. If we need native functionality, we do anything because we are able to write native code and call it from JavaScript. But all the PhoneGap APIs you just saw are based on W3 standards. So this means, for instance, the file API is almost the same file API that Chrome implements right now. So this means if you're building your app based on the PhoneGap API, you're building on standards, which are going to work across many more browsers in the coming years. A good example is the geolocation API, which PhoneGap introduced about three years ago. And the very same API, they're based on the W3 standard. And I think with iOS 4, Apple introduced the capability of the web browser to access the geolocation directly from JavaScript which was exactly the same API, so PhoneGap could take the implementation back without the user, without you even noticing. So this is quite nice. The, let's say the goal of PhoneGap is not that there, is any, that there isn't any more need for it to exist at all. If we could do anything from JavaScript right now, we wouldn't need PhoneGap. So we're building on standards, standards, standards. So this was PhoneGap in about 10 minutes. So let's talk a little bit. We just heard some motivation. We just heard something about PhoneGap. Let's talk about GWT briefly. Um, we just discovered that we can do anything with uh, PhoneGap in the browser, and we just need some HTML5 to drive our app. And of course, as a GWT contributor, I'm voting here for GWT. But there are some very nice things in GWT which make mobile development very good. Um, but let's first talk about GWT in general. It's the Google Web Tool Kit. Um, it's a toolbox to write JavaScript apps in Java, which at first sounds really strange, but it's a very good thing. It's a, it's a client-side framework. It focuses on writing the client, the JavaScript part. It doesn't say anything about the server. It's well integrated with Java, of course, but you can use any backend you like. You can write, run, test, debug everything in Java, which is quite nice because there are such amount of tools in Java. You can do code analysis on your client. You can do unit testing on your client. Really nice things. And it has nothing to do with Swing. That's an important distinction. There is no plugin in the browser. At runtime, this is all JavaScript. At development time, though, we need a way to run the Java code in our IDE while having a browser connected. And with GWT 2.0, we introduced something called the code server, which connects to a developer plugin inside your browser. So for development time, you do have a plugin. So let, let me walk you through a quick example. Let's say you have a routine that's triggered by clicking a button inside the browser. And then you have some lines of code, which is going to change the text of the button. 
let's say. So what needs to happen is you click the button, the developer plugin takes that click, transforms it over to the network to the code server, which triggers your IDE code. You can now debug, run anything in Java. And at some point, you're going to say diff uh, dot inner HTML, some, some text. At that point, the code server is going back to the browser and telling it to change the diff. This is how it basically works in dev mode. For those of you who already know GWT, there's something really cool coming with GWT 2.5, which is source maps. Um, basically, there's one step to compile your app to JavaScript, and this step is going to be much faster with GWT 2.5. There's going to be a so-called fast compile, where you can compile a very, a very big app in a very small amount of time and emit source maps. And those source maps you can load later into any JavaScript VM that supports them. Right now, this should be Chrome and some way in, in Firefox. And you can really go and debug your Java inside the VM of Chrome. Uh, Ray Cromwell posted a really cool video about two or three weeks back about this uh, actually working. So it's quite cool. You can really see <laughs> debugging in Java, although underneath the covers is running JavaScript. But for the normal production time, you're just going to need the normal GWT compiler. It compiles your JavaScript down to JavaScript. And it's compiling down one JavaScript per browser, or in MGWT case, uh, one JavaScript per device. And therefore, we can do some highly, optimi uh, highly optimizations on the JavaScript. And at the rule of thumb, you can think of if you have like 100 lines of JavaScript, you're better off writing JavaScript and forget about GWT. After that, GWT is already better in size and execution speed. Because it can do certain things that you cannot do that easily in JavaScript. It can do dead code removal. It can do inlining, renaming, zipping, secure caching. That really works. I don't want to now talk about all the details, I want to just give you one quick example of optimizations you can do in GWT. Let's say you have that kind of code. You construct a circle which extends from shape. And you want to calculate the area of that circle somewhere in your code. Okay, the GWT compiler takes a look at that code and says, okay, I'm seeing here you're building a circle and putting that into shape, but actually I know that this is going to be a circle from that line. And so I can put the get area from circle here. This is inlining. OK, nothing won so far. But now it takes another clever and says, OK, math.py, this is a constant. And the radius as well, it's a constant. We just set it to 2. And so it just puts that into your JavaScript. And now imagine such kind of optimization across a very big code base, what this could add up to. Also, you have something called deferred binding in GWT. Uh, for a Java programmer, this is something like reflection at compile time. In, uh, in uh, JavaScript frameworks, you get a lot of things like if Internet Explorer do this, else if Firefox do that, and stuff like that. With a GWT app, we don't have such things. Remember, we just compile one script per browser. So we can select at compile time the right implementation per browser. I'm going to get back to that because MGWT heavily relies on deferred binding to be very efficient. And GWT isn't one toolkit where you can only do Java and nothing else. If you want to call legacy code in JavaScript, if you want to be called from legacy code, uh, code in JavaScript, it's very easy. You just put in, in Java the native keyword and some fancy comments, and you can write JavaScript in Java. The compiler is just going to take that and inline it. There are some rules to follow here to call in, back into Java, but it's quite easy. It's very well documented. It's worked really nice, and that is what we're doing for GWT PhoneGap a lot of times. And there's one slide uh, from Joel Weber, which is like, I don't know, five years old almost. It's the compiled script size against the number of widgets you're using. And an empty app has about 400 bytes of code which is about 400 bytes too much. <laughs> if you have an app like Window Alert, let's say Hello World, you get about 5K of code, which is very huge for a simple alert. As soon as you add a, vert uh, add a vertical panel, you get about 28K of code. Those are quite old numbers. I think today they're a little bit better, but it's just about the idea. But take a look here. As soon as you add another widget, 
it only increases very, very, not much less. So basically, vertical panel and button share a lot of the same code. So the GWT compiler can use those things that are the same. It only has to put a little bit more. You can see you get some kind of logarithmic growth against 55K with your um, widgets in place, which is quite nice. If you compare it to jQuery, if you got a little growth to 55K, that's about jQuery size. So we talked about performance on mobile. This is much more important than uh, on desktop. You can, you can think of mobile as um, the desktop of 10, 15 years ago on batteries, which is kind of worse. So we need a tool which does all the optimizations for us. I'm not telling you you can't do such things in, in JavaScript, but I'm, I'm guessing most of you don't even know about the fancy things you can do to optimize, which the DWT compiler does. So I think it's much better to have one tool in place who does all these things with every commit, rather than having to build up your own chain of uh, things to do in JavaScript. Let's talk about one last thing in GWT, and then we're off to the open source projects, which is GWT MVP, which is just a pattern for building your UI. If you're familiar, uh, familiar with um, iOS development, this is what Apple calls MVC. It just means that you structure your application, application in a way that it's testable and easy to maintain. So basically, you have a passive view. You do have a presenter and a model. Those know nothing about the view, so they are testable. And you have a very dumb view, um, which doesn't contain any logic. The only thing it got is the position of its widget. And as, long, as soon as there's any event, it just forwards to the presenter. So this means that I can have all the logic in the presenter, no UI code there, and so I can easily test it in unit tests. And I have very low coupling with the rest of my application. So this has been. GWT. Let's talk about the things I'm, I'm really here to talk about. GWT, PhoneGap, and MGWT. Remember, this is our stack. We do have the device with the browser. We do have some um, native part here, and we need some HTML5, which is going to be GWT. But with uh, GWT, we are lacking the capabilities of calling PhoneGap, so we need GWT for that, and we're lacking some great widgets. That's MGWT. So let's talk about GWT PhoneGap. And GWT PhoneGap is all about access from GWT to PhoneGap, calling the PhoneGap API, which is JavaScript, phone, GWT, Java code. But we can do more than just calling. If you are working in dev mode, running with your IDE, we can emulate the whole PhoneGap API in dev mode. So you can test like you were on a device inside your browser. You can even set. Uh, the return values for the API. Let's say if you're calling into the accelerometer and you need some kind of distinct acceleration, you can set that with a mock API while you're being run in development mode. So you get all the access to an accelerometer, the camera, compass, contacts, file system, geolocation, media, storage, and many more things from Java. In dev mode, we do emulate the API, and we use deferred binding for that. So we don't get any penalty while running live on a phone, because we just switch out the implementation at runtime. So basically, this is GWT phone gap. Let's start to talk about MGWT. Yeah, this depends. This depends on the device. Um, let's say if you want to talk about local storage, local storage on iOS is built into the browser, and you don't need PhoneGap for that. This just works. Um, I know there was. Uh, I know there was one platform that uh, didn't have local storage support, which where PhoneGap actually adds something. And well, I'm, I'm not, not that sure, but for you, it's transparent. It's just the same API on iOS. It's just the local storage API without anything added to it. And uh, uh, GWT out of the box has local storage support. 
I think it was added in 2.2 or something. So let's talk about MGWT. MGWT does a lot of things. Just want to outline them quickly for you. It got touch support, which is out of the box. GWT hasn't, not in a very good way. It has lots and lots of mobile widgets. We're going to take a look at them. It has editor support. Um, for those of you who are familiar with uh, GWT, editor, the editor framework means that you don't have to write the code that takes the data from the server and push it into your views and reads it back from the views in your presenters. You don't have to write that code yourself. You can just use the GWT compiler to generate it. And uh, this is the editor framework. All our widgets that take data support the editor framework. We also support the UI binder framework, which is a way of building your, um, uh, um, your views in XML and let the compiler handle the, okay, build a new flow panel, add a button to it. So you can just write some XML if you like. We do have very fast animations. We have multiple themes. Um, we have a good GWT MVP integration. We do have GWT designer support. And uh, we're available for Maven Central and we are on a very liberal license with Apache 2.0. Does support also support? Yeah, it does. Um, we do have WebCat Mobile on many different platforms as support. We have the iPhone, iPad, Android phone, Android tablets, Blackberry, WebOS, and many other WebKits we don't even know about. On desktop, we have also WebKit like Safari and Chrome. We do have the Firefox on desktop and in trunk there's some support for IE9. We're thinking about supporting Windows Phone 7.5, but we're also thinking about maybe waiting for Windows Phone 8, which is going to have the Internet Explorer 10, which does support the flexible box model, which is much better. But we're going to talk about the flexible box model later. Um, I saw WebKit Mobile. Um, any other browser for mobile, for instance, Opera on Android? Or? No, no Opera support right now on Android. Okay, yeah, well, that's what I was referring to earlier when I asked you if they... Uh, 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 so if, if you're building... Or not. But so, in fact, on Android, it does only run on the computer. Right, MGWT run, runs right now. Oh, sorry. Um, the question was if we were supporting Opera right now on, let's say, Android. And right now, the Opera browser isn't that good on Android. If you come to, if you want to build sophisticated apps with it, and if they are changing some bits in the browser, which they are actually doing right now, it's very easy for MGWT to support Opera as well. But right now, it would be too hard to do that. So right now, we are not supporting Opera. Does PhoneGap Right now, PhoneGap always takes the platform browser with it. You can adopt PhoneGap to use any browser. That's just just a little change in the native code. That's up to you. Right now, on mobile devices, I wouldn't use Opera at all um, from a developer's perspective. I, I don't know about anything else. Um, but um, there was one goal of PhoneGap quite a while back to support a unified browser, a very good browser across different platforms, so building your own browser. This has been not, anyone hasn't started that yet because this is quite a lot of work and there are other things that are way more important than supporting this. But Finally, I could see something in PhoneGap happening like compiling your own browser, like compiling WebKit for every platform. Because right now, if you take a look at mobile, WebKit is, WebKit is the browser to go. Let's take a look at screenshots of uh, MGWT first before we talk about what it actually can do. Um, we have different themes for different platforms. So if we take a look at iPhone, it looks something like this, like a normal iPhone app would look like. But this has nothing to do with native apps. This is just some HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So we do have buttons. We do have different input elements, um, more inputs, some dialogues, progress bars, uh, search bars, slider, tab bars, and many more things. But this gets really nice if you're going to a second platform like the iPad. Because then we're just going to change the appearance of the app a little, add some gray coloring, and we're good to go without doing everything all over again. So basically we have the same widgets here, just a little bit style changes. We have search boxes, we have sliders, we have tab bars. 
And if you come to a third platform like Android, we just style everything to look like an Android application should look like. So we get button bars, buttons, inputs, uh, dialogs, progress bars, pull to refresh widgets, a scroll widget, a slider, and tab bars. To do all those widgets, the first thing you're going to need is touch support. And we do have a very good touch support, which is very well integrated with the GWT event system. Um, and on desktop browsers, we do touch emulation. This is mainly done for testing. So we treat the mouse like one finger touching the display if the mouse button is down and not touching the display if the mouse button is up. So you can do testing in your desktop browsers very easily. The other thing we're able to do is um, we can add a shimmer out existing widgets. Let's say you want to draw something on the canvas, and out of the box the canvas has not a very good touch support because if you add a touch handler on a, on a desktop browser, you just get an error and your app stops there. So what we do, you just pass in the widget you want to use uh, to the touch delegate and you're fine to go. And of course we do have gesture recognizers, something like a tab recognizer for clicks, a long tab recognizer if you hold your finger to the display. Um, you do have a multi-tab recognizer and there are swipe recognizers in the trunk. And this is what it looks like in Java. So you do have your, is, this, is it okay for everyone to read? Hopefully. <laughs> Quite hard back there. Okay, you do have a widget and you, on the widget you just call add touch handler and you pass in your touch handler which basically has four functions, the touch start, touch move, touch end function and touch cancel, which happens in some cases. <coughs> of course, you could just add a, a touch start handler by calling a touch start handler. And for normal GWT code, you just get back the handler registration with a normal click handler on a button. So this is quite similar. The other thing you're going to need if you write mobile apps, even with HTML5, you need specialized inputs. This is something that most people don't realize if they're building web pages. If you ask the user to enter a number, you have to present them with a number keyboard. And as I said before, all those inputs do have editor support. We don't like to write code that uh, is just boilerplate. We need to test that code as well. So why not use the editor framework? And so MGWT supports the editor framework. So let, let me take you through some examples. If you have a text input, we present, of course, a text keyword. OK, no surprises here. With the password input, that's basically the same. It gets interesting with a number input where you do have numbers to input at the, at the first screen. With a phone input, this gets very clear. But there are small things like the URL input. You get the dot and the slash right there. Um, with the email input, you got the dot and the at. And with a date, you got a sophisticated date picker. Um, select inputs, check boxes, and radio inputs as well. This is the standard iPhone soft keyboard. We did take a look into emulating a keyboard, but it didn't do any good. So on some platforms, which do have a very bad keyboard, this is quite bad. OK. But this is the platform's fault, not ours. We can't do anything real about that. If you do have a swipe keyboard installed, it's up to your browser what it does. We are just triggering with standards what we want to have. And uh, in some cases, we already know that there are problems when we try to maneuver around them. Um, OK, specialized inputs. In a set, I'm going to be talking about performance a lot. Because one of the reasons we started MGWT about three years ago was performance in GWT UI libraries. And there are lots of different performances. There's startup performance, there is runtime performance, and there is uh, resource usage. Let's talk about startup at first. And startup always boils down to download, evaluate, and execute. And download you get once per file. And you always get latency plus transfer time. And latency is sometimes very important on mobile devices. And so this means bigger is not always better. In fact, it isn't. Let's say we have a slow network connection. 
not something terribly slow, something we get on our daily lives every day. Let's say we have an edge connection with 5 seconds latency and 4 kilobytes per second transfer rate. This is something we get on a not so good network. And let's compare jQuery Mobile, Sensor Touch, and MGWT in such a use case. So what I had to do to get a fair comparison, because in GWT we have just one output, we don't have like the different CSS, different JavaScript, we just get one output. I have to think of one app that basically fits them all. If you're calling me wrong on any of these, I'm free to change any of those numbers, but basically it's, it's in the right direction. So if you're building a jQuery mobile app, what you need is jQuery, you need jQuery mobile, and you need jQuery mobile CSS. On top of that, you're gonna write some markup, you're going to add some JavaScript code, and you're going to include some resources. The smallest jQuery I could find was 32 kilobytes. The smallest jQuery mobile I could find, highly optimized, 24 kilobytes, jQuery mobile CSS, 7 kilobytes. Quite uh, small. The markup is going to be much bigger here. Um, the code you write is going to be much uh, not that big, and the resource is going to be about 40 kilobytes. Those are the download types for each file, and those add up to 71 seconds. And I think in a normal web environment, nobody's going to wait for 71 seconds for an app to start. This is quite impossible to build an app in such a way. Let's take a look at Sensor Touch. Sensor Touch, you need to include some JavaScript and some CSS. You're also going to write some markup, some code, and some resources. This is Sensor Touch JavaScript, 581 kilobytes. This is the CSS on top, 183 kilobytes. Your markup is going to be very thin. Basically, you just have an empty HTML page. Um, the code is going to be much bigger for that, 40 kilobytes, and you're going to include some resources. So this boils down to this download times, which would mean transferring 825 kilovolts over the wire or waiting 232 seconds for the app to start. And nobody's going to wait four minutes for an app to start. So let's... You know, if you're using PhoneGap, the files are locally on the device. Then it's not that bad. Yeah, it's, it's, on a, it's, it's a comparison for a website. But it's, it's quite bad for a phone as well, if you have such big resources. We can talk about that later. Let's take a look at um, MGWT. With GWT, we don't get such a distinction of resources. We just have GWT output. And for the worst case, you remember the logarithmic growth for widgets, which is our showcase, which got every widget one time. You get 264 kilobytes. That's somehow the maximum we're growing to. So this is our worst case, and our worst case would take to download 64 seconds, which is quite bad as well. No way around that. But I also said GWT has sophisticated caching in place. So with GW standards, out of the box, if you're going to use the app a second time, you're just going to download 7 kilobytes. There's a small script invol uh, involved, which you download, which decide that you already got the uh, right app into, in your cache. So this means 7 seconds, which is much better compared to 64 seconds. There are, but there are more things you can do. You can actually control your output. You can say, okay, I split up my apps into two downloads. And I split it into one very small one. So you can start the app, let the user do th something, and download the rest in the background. This is GWT out of the box, nothing to do with MGWT. But with MGWT, we get another way. We, we took a look at the um, offline spec in HTML5 and decided what we really want to do is we want our users to be able to always access the app, even though they don't have any network connection at all. And there's one thing in the HTML5 specs, it's the offline spec, where you can do such a thing. And remember, with GWT, we see all the different artifacts for compile time. So we can create a manifest file, which you need for offline storage, while compiling. And so you end up with no download at all. Just a small call to ensure that your app is um, uh, not out of date. If your app is out of date, okay, we download again. But if your app is still in sync, it just runs very, very fast. 
And it even runs if you're without any connection at all. Um, this is quite great. One second. This is quite great for me to show MGWT at conferences because it means I don't have to rely on shaky network connections, uh, shaky wireless LANs if you get like 100 people in one room because it always works out of the box. Does it sync in the background or does it sync when you open your app? It syncs in the background. You get an event inside the client cloud that says, okay, I just downloaded a new version of the app. Do you want to restart? No, 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 no. It, it doesn't sync in the background when the app isn't running. Okay. You start the app and then it downloads in the background and you get an event inside your app. You can even see on the iPhone or other devices how much is stored locally. And I think right now the limit is 10 megabytes of JavaScript and you've seen our worst case is somewhat 250K. So if you build a very sophisticated with lots of resources, the biggest MGWT apps I've seen is about 700K, but this is really lots and lots of screens and many resources. Can you uh, stop the, uh, the download? Are you really, is it really necessary to get every download, every new version of this particular app? Or can you, can you say, oh, it's fine for me, this version? Yeah, that's not in the control of the user, no. That is not inside the HTML5 spec. The user you can prompt the user. As, a, as an app, you get an event. and You could cancel the download, but if you choose not to ask a user, you don't ask a user. If they have enabled the storage API, which is by default there in iOS and Android, you're just doing it. But the other thing, if you compare it to, let's remember, 825K for Central Touch, our worst case is 230K. So how do we manage to stay that small? Well, there are many things you need to do. There isn't one single thing we did to stay that small. There are many small decisions we made to be able to be that small. And one was basically no images. On that screenshot, you don't see any images. This is all just CSS. And on those mobile phones, we can use very advanced CSS because they have very advanced browsers. We don't need to uh, take a look at old versions of IE. So all you can uh, you can do all those things just with CSS. Even this little fellow here, just CSS. And we use minimal markup for the things we do. I'm walking you through with a slider, which has a very huge ma markup for MGWT. Normally, widgets have like one diff. This one has three, so we have got one all around. You get one for the background and one for the uh, small pointer. But at runtime, we even go one step further. We obfuscate the style names. And so we get a little bit out of the CSS files. So normally you have like class names like A, B, C, D, which makes up some bytes. And then there's dead code removal. I said GWT is an exactly very good fit for that. And this is one thing we use throughout everywhere in MGWT. Let's say you have those two different sliders, the one for Android and the one for the uh, iOS devices. They share obviously some Java code for moving the pointer, but they don't seem to share any styling at all. So as I said before, we compile down per device. So that means the styling for Android <coughs> isn't part of your app for Android. And the styling for iOS isn't part of your Android JavaScript. And so if you don't use any slider at all in your app, the code isn't there. With Sensor Touch, you got that huge, huge bug of 600K of JavaScript code, which got everything. But you don't have any knowledge what you actually need from that 600K. With MGWT and the compile step from GWT, you only include what you really need. And this is why we compile once per device. So, Of course. I'm going to talk about customization of the looks a little bit later. But first, this is about just about size. So we try to throw out everything you don't really need. If you're just using two widgets of MGWT, there is no need for us to include like 10 more. And you don't get them in your app. This means faster downloads, much faster download time. Um, all unused code just gets removed. If you want to see what really ends up in your app, the story of your compile, which is just a GWT feature, you can ask the compiler to tell you what's, how big in your app. 
um, building on Java classes and tell you, okay, this slider class is 8K in your app. So if you want to reduce your size of your app, this is the way to go. We take a look with every commit at the story of your compiler. And we do use GWT resource bundles. Um, GWT resource bundles are a way of including resources into your app to let the compiler know about every resource in your app. Let's say if you want to do styling, you have to know about resource bundles because we use them because they are really good at optimizing. So if you want to do styling, you do two things. You build a Java interface of your classes. If you have a, a, a CSS class like enabled, you're going to have an interface with a class name enabled. You put those together and the compiler compiles them down to an injectable style sheet. And now you can do great things with that. Because the compiler knows all your classes through the Java interface, he can prompt you if you're missing one in your CSS file. Okay, that's a cool feature because you don't start to wonder with the typo why your style doesn't get applied. But you can also find out, okay, I got three styles applied, but one is never set. You got like 10 styles here, 10 styles here, but in your, in your app you only end up with three because this is only, only three you could call in your Java interface. And let's do a quick example on background. This is what you need to do to have a simple, nice-looking background on, mo uh, on browsers. So you need to do something like for old browsers, just set a color. Then you need like linear gradient for Mozilla, WebKit, WebKit, uh, for Opera, for Microsoft, and stuff like that. So what we can do with the knowledge of the CSS, we know for which device, for which browser we are compiling, is we can take this apart and only put in the things you really need. So for Mozilla, you end up with those. For a WebKit, you end up with those. So removing bytes after bytes, which you don't actually need. But GWT can do more cool things. If you end up with something like this in your CSS, saying the background is blue and afterwards saying it is red, this can be mixed up with different classes. The GWT compiler knows which classes you're going to set when and just says, okay, if you're going to set them at the same time, there's no way background blue is going to take effect ever. Why not just remove it and end up in the compiled code with background red? This removes a lot of, job, uh, of CSS you don't actually need. MGVT themes heavy, uh, heavily rely on resource bundles. If you want to do customization of MGWT, you have to know how resource bundles work. Therefore, it gets heavily optimized. Um, they, the themes look great out of the box. They work out of the box and they are easily customizable. I always get beaten up on the group when I say they are easily customizable, but this, they are easily customizable if you know resource bundles because they just follow the standard pattern. If you want to customize looks of MGWT, um, you can easily build your own theme um, and set this global theme at startup and all your widgets are going to use your theme instead of the uh, themes we supply. You can also just change a specific widget, one or two. And there's a simple pattern throughout the whole framework. If you're constructing a button like this, you're just going to end up using the global theme. If you construct a button like this and pass in your own instance of your own styling, it's just going to use that one. So if you want to customize one widget for your looks, you can just pass in this one widget. If you want to globally customize everything, there's a, um, you know, have to know about resource bundles and there's a standard project in the SVN, no, in, the, in the Git repository, which is a great start because all the classes are there empty. So if you want to mess around with it, that's the best starting point. Currently, there are themes for the iPhone, iPad, Android phone, Android tablet, Blackberry, and desktop. So let's recap on startup performance. Okay, you're talking about looks if you talk about skinning. Okay, right now this is more about looks. If you want to have changes, let's say on Android, I want to build my UI a little different, we do have support for that, but that's not part of theming. Theming is all about looks. 
let's, let's recap startup performance. Remember, startup performance is all about size. And HTML5 has one great thing for us, which is called the offline spec, which we can leverage with DWT very easily to generate an offline manifest, which means no download at all once we've downloaded. We compile once per device, meaning that we throw out every code that you don't actually need for the device. And this leaves us with great startup performance. Let's switch over to runtime performance. If you would have, let's say we would support Firefox Mobile, and we would support, uh, uh, we are supporting the normal Android browser based on WebKit, that could be Chrome or the WebKit version, you would download the app twice when you're using a different browser. This is the same with all GWT apps on, uh, on the desktop as well. If you're building, uh, if you're using a Firefox or a Chrome, you download the app twice. Let's talk about runtime performance. And in runtime performance, one of the major things you can do wrong is layout. Um, there are some JavaScript frameworks which do layout in JavaScript. And this works basically by uh, setting up a resize listener. When it fires, they start some calculations and then they change their DOM and this updates the layout of their whole page. But all of this is running in JavaScript. So basically, on every orientation change, the browser needs to start the JavaScript VM, let it execute some code, and do some layouting, which is quite slow. You can see the app layouting. If you want to have fast layout, there's one basic rule. Never leave native code, which is quite odd because we're building in JavaScript. <laughs> what do I mean by never leave native code? Well, in HTML5, there's one thing, and if you're trying to build for mobile, you should definitely know about this, and it's called the flexible box model. And this is, by the way, why we're having such big trouble with IE9, because IE9 doesn't support it properly. IE10 does support it properly. And um, I'm going to borrow one example from Paul Irish, um, which has done a very good article on this one. Um, you can read it up. Um, and it just says, basically, if I have a diff with three children. I can say this is going to be display box and box orient is going to be horizontal. And this will render in such a way. Okay, no big news here. We could achieve the same, the same thing with the display in line block, but I'm not done yet. If I do something like this, tell the third child to be flexible. This is going to render, uh, this is going to render like this. So it's going to take up this remaining space automatically. I can even do something like this, tell the third and the second child to be flexible. And then they're going to divide up the remaining space. I could even do that with telling the one to take it one uh, box flex two, box flex one. They're going to take up the space two to one. This is even possible. So if you think about it, just with this stuff, you can build basically any layout. Not any. You're missing one thing, the ability to center them or something. No JavaScript involved whatsoever. So how do I center? Two properties, box pack center, box pack align center, and you're done. You can build any layout with those basic properties. So this is why if you're thinking about mobile development with HTML5, you should know about the flexible box model. Because everything that does sizing in JavaScript is plain wrong here. MGWT uses CSI3, exactly the flexible box model to size itself. This is why we have trouble with Windows Phone 7.5. We are thinking about doing an emulation in JavaScript, which is going to be like 10 or 100 times slower than using the actual properties. But we do have the flexibility to do that. If we choose to, we could. So layout is pretty much important. Think about the flexible box model. If you don't know it, read it up. And another important thing is animations. If you want to have animations in your app, you need to have them fast and they're not allowed to feel any sluggish or whatsoever. There are some JavaScript frameworks who do animations like this. Basically, they build up a loop with set timeout 
and periodically update the DOM, which is going to update the display. And this is, for mobile, a very bad idea. This is something like draining user's battery. Like you can watch while draining the battery. So don't do that. What we do in MGWT instead is, um, if you want to have an animation, then let's take the first approach. Um, basically, in the first approach, let's say you want to move a point from here to there, which is quite hard with a mic. <laughs> from here to there. And basically with the first approach, what you're doing is tell move it one pixel, move it one pixel, move it one pixel. There's no way the browser can do that efficiently. The only thing you can do is just lay out every time you're telling it, move it one pixel. What we're doing is telling it, okay, we want to have that point moved from here to there in two seconds. And then we're off. And then we let the browser figure out how to do that very fast. So what we do, is we build up one CSS that can be at compile time or at runtime, depending on what we're doing. Most of the times it's already at compile time, so it's there. We update the DOM with that JavaScript, uh, sorry, with that CSS, and now the browser can figure out how to do that uh, in a very good way. Most of the times on many devices, this means we have actually, actually GPU acceleration. On iOS, this works quite nice. Let's take a look at this progress bar. I'm going to show you that one later on live. On that one, the background is moving. We do that by, this is the CSS, don't mind the backslashes, this is some GWT weirdness. We're just saying, okay, we need an animation which is going to take nine seconds. And this is, has to run infinite, and it has to have a linear timing function. We want the background to move at a steady pace. And we going to specify some keyframes. If we are at zero of our animation, the background position in X should be zero. If we're at 100%, the background position in X should be 100%. And if you take a look at the progress bar, take a look at some performance tools, you discover that this is the same routine underneath the covers that would be running if you uh, would be animating natively in iOS. So this is quite fast. You're not going to drain user's battery with that one. If you actually need to draw you something yourself, let's say on a canvas or something, don't use set timeout, use request animation frame. Because now you're giving the browser at least the chance to sync with its own drawing rate. With set timeout, you're just going to end up drawing too few frames or too much frames. Because you don't have any idea when the browser is actually drawing. With request animation frame, you get caught as many times as the browser actually updates the display. So this is basically what you need to know about animations. If you can, build them with CSS. Read about different um, ways of doing that. Keyframes is one thing, transitions is another thing. Um, if you do it properly, they will be hardware accelerated. There are ways to find out if they are hardware accelerated, if they aren't. If you really need to draw something, at least use request animation frame. It depends. Um, on iOS, that has been great since iOS 3. It works really, really well with, uh, um, uh, with uh, keyframes. On Androids, that's a different story. The Android 2.3 browser is much better with transitions. Under the covers, we switched the implementation for transitions in MGWT between keyframes and transitions. So for the basic, I'm going to show you them in the showcase, for the basic transitions of your screen, you're good to go. They are built in MGWT in such a way. If you want to do animations yourself, you have to encapsulate them in some kind of interface and switch between them. With the Android browser introduced in Android 4, this is somewhat different. Their keyframes are running quite well there. There is some weirdness on older updated devices like the Google Nexus S, which don't have proper hardware support, and so the animations kind of suck as well. But uh, most of the times on newer Android 4 devices, this works out of the box quite nice as well. With Chrome, it's much nice as well on Android. Another runtime performance thing is CSS performance. And one thing where you can spend a lot of time is selector performance. So you spend a lot of um, CPU cycles finding out if a certain class matches or it doesn't match. So what we do with GWT is we know about all the classes you're using. 
so we can give them unique names. So we don't need any deep nested selectors. We can just say, in your code, you say something like, I have to get the class enabled, like 100 times at runtime. This class name gets transformed to a different name, and you have simple selector matching. So in MGWT, we don't spend like hundreds of CPU cycles finding out if, if a certain class should match. We just use simple matching, which is very fast. Uh, some, uh, something like um, backgrounds using images. Uh, some people do something like update with JavaScript the DOM, so like setting background URL. In the worst case, they go to a server, fetch that uh, uh, image, update the DOM, and update the display, which is a very bad idea. We already talked about that. Lots of things can be done with CSS images. No images in here. There are some cases where you need images, like for buttons and stuff like that, where the structure is just too complex, uh, too complex to build it with CSS. Then, of course, we inline some kind of buttons. But you can do fancy tricks with them as well and reduce the byte count here as well. We already did that. If you want to know about something like this, ask me later. I got some nice stories there as well. So this was some things about runtime performance in MGWT. Let's go into a quick thing about UI Binder. UI Binder is the ability in GWT to build your uh, UI with XML. All MGWT widgets do support UI Binder. For some special cases, um, uh, take a look at the Java doc. They should be all documented. If there's something wrong, please feel free to bring an issue up on the user group or on the issue tracker. This is what it looks like. Well, it's pretty bad for the people in the back. Um, this produces that. I'm going to talk you through it. You got some XML, you got two namespaces import the standard Google import and the standard MGWT import. Then we start off with the MGWT layout panel, which is all you can see. Then you do have a header panel from here to there, which is going to have on the left side a header button. This is that one with a back button. This is why it has that nice arrow and uh, some text. And inside here, you can see in the center, there's just a GHTML tag. So you can mix GWT widgets and MGWT widgets, which is absolutely fine. Some other frameworks do have problems with that. Um, on, on the bottom part, we have at first a scroll panel, so we can move the slider. Then we do have a flow panel, again, a GWT widget. Inside that flow panel, we do have the slider and the standard G, uh, HTML panel. So this is one way to build your uh, UIs when, if you like UI binder, you know what you're looking at. So then there's a GWT designer support. If you like to click UI together with some kind of designer, we do support the GWT designer. There had there was one change that had to be made to GWT designer in order to support MG, to support MGWT because we use a lot of permutations while compiling. Uh, this has been done about six weeks in trunk and should be released right now. Then there's the great support of the HTML history API, which I'm going to show you in the showcase. I can talk about that very long, but it's much easier to show it. Yeah, this is basically what it looks like. This is our stack from device up to the phone gap part with GWT phone gap and the UI part with MGWT. I'm almost done now. Let's recap. We talked about that the things we're going to do with our phones are going to simply explode in a very short amount of time. And we already got a very good solution for finding out what we want to do. It's web search on Google. It's the web for bringing software to different platforms. And for the future, we just want to build things once. And PhoneGap is a very good idea to do that. PhoneGap bases on HTML5 standards. And if you're going to build on HTML5 standards, today you have to think a little bit about performance. And then there's one tool which is all about performance, which is GWT in a large sense. And those two libraries, MGWT and GWT and PhoneGap, which are made for great looking UIs, which are very, very fast. So if you want to know more about MGWT, m-gwt.com, or follow me on Twitter. So right now I want to show you a quick demo on an iPhone. So, 
it's, I can make the slides available, but normally those are just pictures. The slides are very useless without me talking. What we can do, yeah, what we can do is make the video available. Um, everyone satisfied? Can I go to the next slide? Okay, one question. Um, normally, there's one rule of thumb for the Apple App Store. If you're loading content from a remote server which drives your app, you're out of the store. So you have to have your JavaScript locally inside the app. There is no way for Apple to find out if you're loading some things from the server. But in general, I would recommend you to just do the packaging for those permutations which are for iPad or for iPhone. Just put them inside the app and you're good. It's an easier deployment model. Right now, what I want to do is show you a demo. Feel free to ask questions at any time. And for the first part, thank you. Okay. There's, there's one good way. <laughs> there's, there's one good thing you can do in conferences with an iPhone to really embarrass yourself. Yeah. I thought when uh, unlocking such a phone, um, Apple, you, you can't see what you're typing, but you can see where you're typing. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to really disconnect, unlock the phone, and reconnect. Okay, we're good to go. So the first thing I want to show you is I'm just going to go to the MGWT website. Oh, sorry. I should be able to type my own website. We have a good working uh, wireless line here. I'm just going to tap on the showcase. Which the worst case, because I already downloaded the showcase, the only thing it has done right now is just ask, does, did the manifest change? It didn't while I was driving here, so it was very quick. I can show you again by just going into, this is what I mean by cluttered phone. Um, I can put it into, it's German for airplane mode, um, and go back to the website. No, I don't want to see, I want to use any wireless line, so I'm offline right now but I can reload the app. This is quite nice, even though being in a web app. So the other thing you can do, you can add it to your home screen. This is the web app, just add it to the home screen. No, nope. so, and it's running as well. So now we're in full screen. So what you're seeing here is some kind, the worst case for an MGWT app, it's just got every widget in there. So we do have animations, something like slide forwards and slide backwards. As I said before, we're giving the browser here the chance to optimize, so it's quite fast. We can also slide up and slide down. We can do a dissolve. We could do a flip. And we could do a pop. We could do a swap. This is basically in Java code, this is just an enum. You could specify your animation, you're good to go. So let's take a look at real UI. This is the first thing, this is a scroll panel. You can see the little What's that called in English? The little gray... Scroll bar? Oh, scroll bar. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the little scroll bar there, this is just CSS. So let's say we can have different buttons here, which can add touch supports. Ah, I, wanted, I wanted to talk to you about layout. As soon as I turn this, you can see the layout performance. Because the layout is done in CSS, it doesn't need to consult the JavaScript layout. And you can see while turning, I don't know if you can see it on the real screen, but you should be able to see it. It's very fast when it comes to layouting. 
while turning, you still got the, you already got the layout done, because it's telling the browser basically what you want to have, and you can execute that in C code. Then we do have different buttons, which kind of do different. Um, not that interesting. Okay, here we have the different inputs I was talking about. Let's say if I hit a date input, I get a date picker. If I hit uh, something to enter a phone number, okay, it does look like I want to enter a phone number. We do have checkboxes, which I can use. Radio inputs. Then we do have different pop-ups. This is something sliding from down there. We do have alert boxes, which look like iPhone alert boxes should look like. And we do have confirms. Uh, we do have a, the progress bar I was talking about with the animation. And of course, this is not an animation which is going to drain my battery. I could just let this run and run and run and run without any problems. And then there's the progress indicator. This is also done. This is, look, this is looking weird right now. But this is all just done with uh, CSS. Then there's a pull to refresh widget, which works like this. Uh, the scroll widget we already talked about. Of course, I can scroll in two dimensions. A simple search box. And it's it's small thing, uh, things. Um, my phone is in German, so this is suchen. This is the same in English for search. And we do have the slider. We talked a lot about the slider. And then there's a tab bar with different icons. Here goes the same thing. When I do some layouting, it's quite fast. So this is what it looks like on uh, iOS. The other thing I got prepared as a demo is a GWT phone app app, which is basically just everything in one app. This is an actual app running phone app with GWT phone app and some basic functionality. So this is the accelerometer. If I turn the device, you can see the value is changing. So this should be something about 10. If I turn it like this, the other value should be about 10. If I turn it like, uh, what did we have? Like this one? Yeah, that's the last one. Oh, I have to say, this is based on the phone gap trunk, the MGWT trunk, and the phone gap trunk. I was fixing some issues. Maybe we're going to see some issues right now because I didn't have any time to look at it, but I'm feeling lucky today. <laughs> Let's try to shoot a picture. So right now you can see there's another native app coming up. No, native screen, not an app. I can shoot the picture, say, okay, I like the picture. I can do some scaling and stuff like that, and say I want to use it. And we end up back in the app with the phone, uh, with the picture shoot. We can also read Compass, of course. Um, we could search through my contacts right now. Let's say if I say DNA, if I say DNA, I get back my own contact and some other people. Um, uh, geolocation, of course, which is going, it's not going to work inside a building, of course. Um, in media, I'm not sure if we get, which works as well. So if you want to play media with phone gap, that's, that's okay as well. Uh, notification, okay, some, some small things like a beep. So this is basically a phone gap app made with everything inside. Let's switch to an iPad. How am I doing on time? Uh, yeah. It's, uh, three, four minutes. Okay, great. Four minutes, yeah. So this one is also in flight mode, as you can see it on the left with the little airplane mode. And it's also in full screen. So you can see we have the same animations that I just showed you on the iPhone. They also work here. So this is basically the same app. The only thing that's different in boot up code, we're saying, okay, we don't, we need two regions, one for the master, one for the detail. This is the only code change. It's like two lines of code. So, uh, if you go to the website and uh, try it out on your Android phone, it looks like I just showed you on the slides. Um, I don't have any Android phone with me, which I can take uh, connect to an HDMI connector. Otherwise, I could just have shown you an Android device as well, but with. And switch, uh, the only 
presentation that the screen is also... Uh, yeah. ah, there's, there's one nice thing which I haven't mentioned before. We also got a popover for uh, content that's uh, here. This is all, no, basically no images, just CSS. Okay, I think I'm done. I think uh, all of you are waiting for the dinner. Maybe some more questions. Yes, uh, MGWT started didn't start out as uh, as a um, uh, as a product nobody was using. We got frustrated about three years ago with uh, mobile frameworks. No, we, in general with the desktop frameworks with GWT and decided to build something on our own and as well with mobile. So the company I work for has plenty of apps built exactly with uh, MGWT. We also have, if you want to, we're starting to uh, starting a. Um, uh, reference list on the web page right now to get some more people out there um, who already have built something with MGWT. You could be using MGWT with desktop, but MGWT is made for mobile phones. What you normally would do in GWT, you get all those compile permutations. Let's say you're compiling for an Internet Explorer desktop. You would include a different layout, but the model and the presenter code we were talking about would be absolutely the same. Just the structure of your interface would look different. Um, we've transferred actually a lot of applications would have been built for desktop with GWT MVP to use with, uh, G, uh, with uh, MGWT. MGWT. MGWT says nothing about support for a certain kind of um, development. You just get some basic widgets. And for mobile, you just swap out your view. And normally, if you do MVP, um, uh, if you do MVP correctly, view code is about 20% of your project. So for mobile, you're switching somewhat 20% of your project, which is kind of fine. So if you do responsive design, yeah, basically you're doing two designs, one for desktop and one for tablets and one for uh, phones as well, yeah. And at compile time, we swap those out. Is it supposed to work? Uh, sorry. Well, it, it, it depends. Um, I know there's one book out there who's using MGWT and GWT PhoneGap for building games in the browser based on the canvas. But in the past, um, let's say MGWT, the background I come from is uh, business data, vis visualizing business data. And this is what MGWT is really good at. Um, I know that you can run WebGL stuff in the iOS browser right now, but this is all not supported on a very wide basis. So I would recommend keeping away from those things right now. And if you really want to do something that's animating, the way to go is uh, uh, native right now. And this might change within, I would think, a year or something. Maybe we're seeing some stronger APIs and some better support on mobile browsers, and then we can talk about how we can use GWT to drive games and stuff like that. But right now, those things are mainly supported in desktop Chrome and stuff like that. I would keep away from, let's say, games and things in mobile with JavaScript. There is the Play Framework. The Play Framework, which is Scala on the server. No, that's, that's a sh I, uh, I don't know if you heard about the Play Framework. Yeah. Ah, sorry, the um, for building games. OK. Building games, yeah. yeah. I can show you one thing we did for um, 
for uh, mobile apps with MGWT, um, we had to visualize some documents like PDFs from a server. And what we did is um, we rendered them as uh, JPEGs or what's that in English, PNGs. And we downloaded them and put them on a canvas with scrolling and flipping and something like that, which worked really well and which worked across many devices very well. Um, it was an issue on older iPads with uh, iOS 4. The, the canvas was quite slow. You could only get it on 15 to 20 frames, which is quite bad, but only the iPad 1. With iOS 5, this disappeared totally, and you get around, if you're really driving it, about 100 frames on a normal canvas, which is quite okay. So maybe it's time to think about it when all the devices are up to iOS 5. Maybe you can do some development there, but I haven't had any uh, experiences there, so my recommendation can only be keep away from it right now. But you can use the canvas quite nicely to do some small things. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I missed something, but you say you compile for different devices. Yeah. And when you uh, make available to anybody your application, how do you uh, show them that this one is for an iPad and this one is for an Android? OK, this I, happens. I, I missed something there. Maybe I didn't tell that exactly. Because for me, as a GWT developer, for more than five years, for me, this is <laughs> every day's work. Yeah. Um, with GWT, you get the big app for every platform, let's say. For an iPad, you get the big app like 236K, and for the iPad, for the iPhone. And then there's a small selection script that you run, which is gets, never gets cached. So this is a very small script, and it determines what kind of device are you running, and it determines what kind of big file you have to download. So yeah. there you go. Thank you. So everyone waiting for dinner. Yes, I guess. Oh. Knock, knock. Uh,